Right, OK. So this is very, very awkward. Welcome to this, <laughs> Welcome to this talk, um, which I've given eight times. Uh, this talk works much better with a larger audience, <laughs> right? So now it's just become a me bitching to 12 people or less. OK, so bear with me. Um, if, um, and, I'll, and I'll give you these little disclaimers. And, and someone just turned around and said, I'm not putting up with that crap. Right, quick disclaimers. This is not going to be informative. It's not going to be thought provoking. It's not going to be inter entertaining. It sure as hell isn't going to be inspirational. OK? So honestly, if you're here for any of those things, just leave. Go next door. John is doing an awesome talk on C Sharp 7. Right? This is me literally just pissed off and ranting about life. OK? So if you're up for that, stay. This is me. I normally don't talk about myself. I literally don't. And I hate people that say, I don't normally talk about myself in a talk. And then they go on for five minutes talking about themselves. Um, I don't normally talk about myself, but it's to give you a little bit of context, OK? This is me when I was two years old. I was born in Iran. My mother said we're moving to Spain. I shit myself, and I got into computers, and I became extremely grumpy, OK? And <laughs> so kind of like everyone here. Um, background to this talk, because everything, there's a why in everything. And Greg, a friend of mine, Greg Young, he said, the guy that did the CQRS event sourcing, great guy, very smart. He said, how do you come to build stuff? Build stuff is a conference in Lithuania in which you learn a lot of things and you do a lot of things that stay in Lithuania. <laughs> and he said, but, and I said, but what? He said, you have to give a talk on WCF, right? So that's kind of like getting a wedding invitation that you've so long wanted to go for, to go to, and saying, I finally made it on the list once in my life, opening it up and seeing this instead of the address, <laughs> right? And you think to yourself, like, why? Why would I want to go? Why would he pick on me in this sense? Why would he say that you have to talk about WCF? I wrote a book on WCF. Wait, that's not the worst part. I wrote it in Spanish, <laughs> right? And now in Spain, we've got a good habit of reading. We're very cultured. We just don't know you can pay for books. So on top of the fact that you don't make much money on books, I, I got a lot of people to read it. it. Unfortunately, every time we do WCF Hardy, I still show up. And I'm trying to get Google to forget me, but it's not working out well because they say, why? They don't understand the involvement here. But getting back to WCF, now, if, how many of you here have done WCF? Brilliant. It was brilliant, right? Yes. And before that, there was Corba, if you remember Corba. Before that, at the same time of Corba, there was Midas. Any Delphi people here? So I used to do Delphi, and there was this thing called Midas. And the only screenshot I found was, ironically, in Russian. And um, Midas was a great technology that allowed you to do distributed computing. And it came around the same time as DCOM, right, which is COM. And, my, and Microsoft said, let, let me screw you even more in a distributed fashion. Um, so there was COM, there was DCOM, there was CORBA, there was MIDAS, and then one day came this great unification, right? And this great unification was this new programming model that was going to save us. It was absolutely brilliant, right? It was a unified model for all communication needs. It, compiled, it complied with the four pillars of SOA. Now, these four pillars of SOA were from Don Box, who at the time happened to be working for Microsoft, who was the person behind WCF, same company. It didn't comply with the 11 pillars of SOA by Thomas Earle, but that's OK. As long as it complied with those four pillars, it was great. And it was sold to us as the silver bullet. right? And they said to us, it's easy as ABC. A standard for the address, which means where you want to talk to. B standard for the binding, which means how you want to talk. And C was a contract, which means what exactly were you going to talk? OK? And you'd configure it at runtime. Now, back then, we didn't have fancy JSON. We had XML, right? And it had like its configuration options, which doesn't fit on one screen, or two screens. Just to give you some perspective, <laughs> those were the options. And they said, if you build it, it will run. Now, the key thing there was you have to learn to configure it first. But if you did that, it would run. And we used to go around, including myself. Obviously, I wrote a book about it, so I'm going to promote that sh this, this thing. And I went around and saying, this is fantastic, and it's brilliant, and it works. But things started to fail. And then you know what happened? They said, your issue is WCF. 
right? WCF is overly complicated. It, it's adding a lot of overhead that is not required. And those promises were not delivered. And you're like, but you just came in and told me to rewrite this damn thing using WCF. And now you're telling me that it's, it, it's, not, it's not valid. Someone had the bright idea of saying every class should be a service, and we all just kind of facepalmed at that point, and it all went to hell. So the silver bullet was not delivered, and the rest is history, as you well know. Okay? Now, if you've not used WCF, if the one thing that's been holding you back about using WCF is that it's not open source, you'll be glad to know that it's now open source on GitHub, so go right ahead and adop adopt it. And it wouldn't be fair of me to pick on Microsoft despite being more a Microsoft conference this because Java had it too, and you know what they say with Java. You have a problem, use Java, now you have a problem factory. <laughs> and we were in a, we were in a conference in, in, in in Paris, and I was, we were doing like the speaker cruise thing along the boat, and I was up there taking a picture of the Eiffel Tower. And Antonio Conclavis, who's a, who's a big Java 2E guy, you know, he comes up to me and he's like, oh, you know, never with his French accent, never in history has a man created something so horrible and useless, which is utter nonsense because there is Java 2EE. <laughs> so, you know, and Java has its own fair share of things, and it's been criticized heavily, like, you know, we have Fizzbuzz Enterprise Edition, right? If you know Fizzbuzz, there is an Enterprise Edition which pulls down half of the internet. And then came along Spring, Spring said, let's build a better enterprise, right? Spring is a new framework that's 12 years old that said, let's build a better enterprise and let's make things better. And then they came up with things like this, which is an actual class from Spring called Abstract Singleton Proxy Factory Bean. Now that Manual, I'm not making it up, actually says that this is a convenient proxy factory bean superclass for proxy factory beans that create only singletons. That is the description of this class, right? But there is hope for distributed computing, and you all know what I know, mean. It's called microservices. Now, if you're not familiar with microservices, it's a bunch of little things working together to join something big. So it's kind of like doing a lot of little SOAs, except you fail small, you fail often, and you fail a lot. Or as I like to say, you move from a single ball of mud to orchestrating a lot of shit. Okay? <laughs> And a, a good friend of mine, Simon Brown, said, you know, he kept saying that if you can't build monoliths properly, you sure as hell aren't going to be able to build good microservices. But this has given way to us having conversations like how many lines is a microservice? You know, it's not even about classes anymore because classes, someone said every class should be a service, so consequently, multiple methods should constitute a microservice. Fortunately for us, tools can help, and this is a prototype I've been working on for IntelliJ, which allows you to select some code and extract a microservice. Okay? If you don't know how to implement a microservice, there's already a draft by NAIST that tells you exactly what a Microsoft service is in 670 pages. And if you are worried that microservice isn't the next big thing, it is because if you go to microservices.org, it redirects to IBM. Therefore, it's already mainstream. But I'm joking because microservices is a thing of the past, OK? The future, as you know, is serverless. It's called serverless architecture. Take note, OK? It is serverless architecture. And I read a blog post that they said how they decided to use serverless nanoservices architecture with AWS to make CAPI, right? How many of you are familiar with serverless architectures? Right, it basically means put all of my dependencies in the hand of a single vendor. But it's, it's, it's quite cool. Um, and they're telling us that that is actually a silver bullet. Now, I've been talking a lot about computing and distributed computing and that, and it's not only an issue with distributed computing. We've also had this issue with data persistence. In the early days, we all wrote our DALs. How many of you are familiar with what a DAL is? It's a data access layer. And then someone came along and said, ORMs are much better, and you know we had Hibernate and Hibernate. So what did we all do at that point? We wrote our own ORM. We didn't use the existing ones because we could do it better. So we wrote our own ORMs, and then we came up with all of these different options. And then at some point, we said, no, maybe we should just give in and use a, 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 an existing ORM. And at that point, in order to save our bacon, what we decided to do was create abstractions around these ORMs so that we wouldn't ever be locked into an ORM. And that way, we wouldn't get the benefits of the ORM, and we would add a whole bunch of nonsense for nothing. How many of you created abstractions? How many of you moved ORMs in a single project? Yeah, there you go. Uh, at some point, someone said ORMs are bad. 
And they said that you need to separate your writes from your reads, they said. Now, if you're not familiar with CQRS, initially when you used to Google CQRS, Google was respond saying, did you mean cars? No, I meant CQRS, which stands for Command and Query Responsibility Segregation. CQRS, how many are you doing it? It's brilliant, right? And if you, don't do, if you do CQRS, you have to do event sourcing, because otherwise it's not cool. And of course, you can't do any of these things if you don't do domain-driven design. But at the end of the day, we realized that it was nothing about this. It wasn't about data access layers. It wasn't about ORMs. It was nothing about this. It was the actual underlying storage mechanism that was an issue. And we were all very familiar with the SQL model, and we all loved the SQL model. And then along came this thing called NoSQL. NoSQL was fantastic. It told you how you can store things, right? And depending on the model that you were choosing, you could store things, or, for example, you could not store things. And they said to us that this was a silver bullet, right? And they said, this is the problem. You need to move away from SQL Server to something like a document database. Some of us at some point, some of them at some point, I always include this as myself as well, because I've been through all of this crap and I've said all of this crap as well. We decided that it's not anything to do with that. It's the actual platform that's the problem, OK? And normally when people said that your platform sucks, they said your community sucks too. Um, so the, there's a .NET version of this slide, which is called .NET sucks, Node.js is great. OK, how many of you have heard that before? OK. There's a Java version, which is the JVM sucks, Node.js is great. Now, unfortunately for the Node folks, it already sucks because Go is great. Go is the next best thing. And then you get blog posts and articles in very prominent magazines that says, why Google Go programming is going to rival Java in the enterprise. Of course, if you look back three months, you'll get the same thing about how Java is going to die because of Node.js. And normally when people complain about this and they moan about the platform, they do it in the form of a blog post. Right? And they say, I'm leaving Java, or I'm leaving .NET. And it, they blurb about a lot of things, but you, there's some key words that you can identify in that blog post, which is too much ceremony, scale, I need scale, I need enterprise, I don't need enterprise, and you don't help each other. That is very, very common pattern that you come across. And then they make uh, announcements like, you know, I've moved to Node and our productivity has increased tenfold. Of course, nobody actually sat down to measure that productivity or see if it had increased tenfold. But, you know, it does enable us to again say things like, we now ship microservices using Docker, aligning our technology stack with our business needs. All this made possible with Go. Yes, some CTO somewhere. And some of us, of course, realized that changing platform didn't really work because it was really our, our code that was the problem. And it wasn't our code because technically we rewrote that code in a different platform, so maybe it wasn't potentially us. So you know, the, the platform wasn't the silver bullet either because the quality didn't improve. And talking about quality, how many of you do unit testing? Did you all go through this phase of, I used to actually just ship code and get paid for it? And then they said, test it. No, screw you. And then I decided to, oh, no, this unit testing thing is actually quite nice. And at some point in my life, I decided to unit test absolutely everything. And then they said, that isn't enough. You have to combine these unit tests in, a, in a creating permutations. And then you've got to do integration tests. And at some point, I, I realized that I'm not shipping code anymore. So I stopped doing unit testing. And right now, I'm about somewhere here, right? <laughs> Um, and you know, when we were doing unit testing, a few came along and said, you're doing it wrong because it's, you've got to do TDD. It's red, green, refactor. If you don't do TDD, you're not doing proper design. Therefore, it's not good. Um, then there was another tendency, which was called BDD, Behavior Driven Development, um, by Dan North. He coined the term. And he said it's about communications. Right? It's about communicating and talking to people. What did we do as developers? We thought it was about frameworks. And we came up with different frameworks. And then we said, it's brilliant, because now my framework, my, my customer, can write the tests, and I just implement things. And I don't even have to talk to them. Yes, we did that as well. So the problem is the paradigm now. Apparently, they're telling us a lot of, uh, a lot of things that you're hearing is that it's actually about the, the, the paradigm that we're following in why we're not accomplishing this success and this silver bullet that they've been promising us. Now, how many of you have read this book? Right. A few years ago, I remember a blog post by Jeff Atwood. 
in which he had claimed that he hadn't read this book. And everyone said, you are crazy. How can you call yourself a software engineer if you've not read this book? Nowadays, if you say you're reading this book, they'll frown on you and say, are you for real? Are you still doing object-oriented programming? Because nowadays, it's all about functional programming. Right? So recently, I heard a tweet come through saying that functional programming is a radical new paradigm. It was by someone from the JavaScript community that was only invented 75 years ago. But, and as you know, there's only one way to do functional programming, which is? You see, I'm in a .NET crowd. Of course, you're going to say F sharp. You know how you know an application is written in F sharp? No, because they'll bloody tell you this. <laughs> no, it's Haskell, right? But actually, talking about F sharp, I came across a really good tweet the other day that said functional programming in F sharp helps Jet raise $500 million for VC. Congrats, Jet Technology and points to a blog post on TechCrunch that didn't say a word about F sharp or programming or anything. But apparently, F sharp, you know, the VC came and said, what are you using, C sharp or F sharp? F sharp, there you go, here's $500 million, right? Because that's how VCs invest. Mind you, having said that, it might be the case. Did you recently hear about all those VC people that invested in Nintendo only to find out that Pokemon Go wasn't written by Nintendo and the stocks came crashing? Yeah, it does explain a lot of startup ideas. But fortunately for us, the future is bright. And if you can see, it's JavaScript, right? And JavaScript is productive. How many of you like JavaScript? Right. We have Node. JavaScript is fantastic. If you're not familiar with Node, remember all of that crap that we wrote on the client side. Now we can write it on the server side as well. That's what Node is about. And, and Node was doing really, really well for some time. And then at some point, someone forked Node, right? Now, think about what just happened. An open source project on GitHub got forked, and all hell broke loose, right? And then you saw tweets like, if you're stuck on legacy technology like Node.js, only two weeks after it got forked. Two weeks, right? People were using the new one, and Node.js was, was legacy technology. Fortunately for all of us, they all made up and were friends again. In fact, Wired Magazine didn't even bother changing the graphic. Because you can look at that as a fork and as a reunification. Um, and it was all good. Everyone was happy. And then Microsoft came along and said, we're forking Node. Now, Node, and Node enables JavaScript on the server. But it's not JavaScript, the language itself, that was designed in a week that's so productive, but the entire ecosystem that is around Node. I mean, you've all heard of NPM, right? NPM is the package manager for Node. If you stay long enough on that website, it also says that it's the package manager for Bower, which if you don't know what it is, it's a package manager. Okay? And you've got one point. 5 billion people having downloaded these packages, and you've got over half a million packages on there with very good discoverable names. Those are actual names like Testacular, Moron, JS, Happy, whatever, shit, JS, things.js. In fact, Shai had come up with a game where you think of a noun, Google the noun, and if it exists as a package, you drink. And I promise you, you will get drunk. Okay? Now, recently, what happened in the Node ecosystem was that one developer broke the entire world because he pulled a package, he deleted a package from the NPM repository called LeftPad, which was basically 11 lines of code packaged up. There was more lines of code for packaging it than um, the actual code itself. This is the actual code, right? And, and I, when this happened, I started to look around, and I started to think, like, is there a package really this small? And I dug deeper and deeper. And in fact, I found a package which is called isArray, which tells you if something is an array. This has had 18 million downloads last month. It has 72 packages that depend on it, and it actually fits in this tweet. <laughs> right? This is what we've created. And I entered a debate with someone on Twitter, and, you know, I said, you know, like, OK, copy pasting code from Stack Overflow was one thing. And the response was, why should I copy paste code from Stack Overflow if I can just search for that functionality and install it? This is what we've created, right? Let's just npm install and bundle everything together and call it productivity. And I started to look more, and I found is negative, is positive, is zero negative, which I don't know what it is, but it's apparently a, a variation of negative, um, is, is zero positive, is array, is not array, is, is false, is something like array, and has identity crisis, which I contributed. Um, <laughs> fortunately for us, some people saw 
this as a major problem and also saw it as a business opportunity and they created LeftPad as a service. So in case anyone pulls down LeftPad, you can always go to the service and it's available with an SLA, okay? And as I say, why search on Stack Overflow when you can do NPM search development from now on, right? I'll give you an example of how bad it is that you can actually do FizzBuzz using packages in JavaScript. Now, JavaScript, again, with all these packages, it also provides us with very, very good, excellent frameworks. How many of you have heard Angu about AngularJS? Right? It's, it's awesome. And I want to place emphasis on the buy and the Google, which apparently means that they give you some guaranteed upgrade compatibility or something like that. How many of you have migrated from one to two and have lived to tell it? No, you're, that's still probably somewhere in the basement trying to migrate. Um, so. When this happened, what I did is I used to use Angular and I said, screw this, I'm jumping on the React bandwagon, right? React.js from Facebook, fantastic. And I went to the React website and behold, by my surprise, I found a new button that said compatibility certificate. And I clicked on it and it said, React.js is going to be compatible, backwards compatible. Obviously, I'm being sarcastic here and a little bit joking, but my point was that a lot of people complained that you will never have this problem with React, right? This was only a specific problem with AngularJS until I came across this post which says upgrading from React 0.11.2 to 0.14.7 in 374 easy steps, right? Um, they, they, they solved that problem with AngularJS. They call everything RC. And RC, if you remember, back in the old days meant release candidate, which meant we're not going to change anything until really hell breaks loose and we've, there's some bad bug. Now it's just kind of a new version, right? And, and when you reproach Microsoft for doing it, they're like, well, look at what the Angular team is doing. So WordPress was rewritten in Node and React.js, open sourced against VP's will. VP stands for vice president. This is huge. Is this end of PHP as a major language? This is, this is the, the, the knee-jerk reactions that we get in, in our industry, well, in the world. And then we, we had React Native, which they told us that this is a game changer, and this time it really does change everything. No, really, it does. And React and React Navi Na Native are, are kind of more like a library approach, right? So they're not framework. They don't lock you into the framework. And they come up with this thing called a Flux architecture, which basically you have a web API that talks to web API utils that interacts with action creators, that goes to ac actions, a dispatcher that has callbacks, store, and then there's some events and React views, and, but it's really nicely decoupled. It's fantastic. Now, some people realized this and they said, this is bad. So they came up with a different one, which they call Reflux. Unfortunately, I didn't find the logo for it. This is the best thing that I found. <laughs> and I very much like this tweet, which shows us 12 years of progress in web development, right? I remember those days. And now look at it. We have created so much crap over development, thinking that we're making it simple, right? But no, we're not. it's not about simplicity. It's about scalability in terms of maintainability. Yes, but by the time, you know what? One of the best things that we have as developers is that we create something and then we move on and we say, to hell with that. Whoever comes next will maintain it, right? So, but they say that this is a silver bullet. But if you don't like AngularJS, you don't like React, you just have to wait one day before the internet will see a new framework of JavaScript, okay? And one of these new things was the birth of isomorphism. If, how many of you have heard of isomorphism? So basically, this is how the story went. Server-side rendering wasn't smooth back in 2000. And someone said, let's do this client-side. But client-side was very hard because it was called JavaScript. And they said, well, why don't we create a framework? And then someone said, you've lost your SEO, right? And they said, let's create another framework. And that's isomorphism, which renders the same thing on the client-side and the server-side. Because why? Because we can. Um, and, but there's six reasons why isomorphic web apps is not the silver bullet you're looking for. Oh, well, bad, too bad. But let's go a little bit back to basics. And let's, um, you know, if you, if you don't like any of these frameworks, you, there is a, there's an alternative for you, which is called um, vapor.js. It's a, it's a JavaScript framework. And believe it or not, that's just an empty tag. But it's got something like, last time I checked, 812 stars and 190 forks on GitHub. Now, judging that we adopt technology by GitHub stars and forks, tells you quite a bit, right? But there is hope. 
there is hope because as you know, TypeScript, language, team visited, Google, and now we have everything in TypeScript. No more JavaScript, the death of JavaScript. I, for one, vouch for that. Let it go and become a dying virtual machine. But getting back to React and about naming things, we are also beyond the whole functional programming. We are now reactive, right? Um, it's all about reactive programming, especially in the Java world that they've just discovered reactive extensions. And it's, it's about the only thing that we contributed back to the, to the Java community. And don't call it functional reactive programming because it's not about that. And what do we do as developers when we create a new paradigm and we discover some new technology? What is the first thing that we do even before creating a framework for it? No, we don't tweet it. We create a manifesto. And we say that everybody should be reactive and all applications should be scalable and all applications should be resilient and reliable. And now it actually makes sense for me to say something like I'm developing a functionally reactive RESTful microservice and I'm writing it in Rx CoffeeScript, which is a flavor of Rx Java for CoffeeScript, building it with Grunt and shipping it in Docker. And it makes absolute sense. And Docker, well, because containers are the thing now. And in my view, the only way that we could guarantee working software is that it works on my machine. So screw it. Let's just ship my machine as a container. <laughs> right? But it allows us to move really, really quickly. OK? So but Docker is a silver bullet until someone comes along and says, no, it's not. Um, and let's not forget that we're just building Docker images on things that are put up in the Docker registry that we don't know what exactly is in that image or what security potential holes it might have or what legal potential holes it might have, but it's so awesome, OK? But building software is actually hard, and we've discovered this through Make tools, which we've tried to look for this silver bullet as well. First of all, there was Make. How many of you are familiar with Make? We paid basically everyone use Make. And then there was Ant and in the Java world, and then we adopted it as Nant. And then in the Java world came Maven, and everyone kind of like died. And that was the point when you started the new project, and it was like pulling down the entire internet. And it, we inherited that with NuGet and with NPM as well. We, we kind of like to do that. Um, and then someone said Ruby. And someone else said, oh, that's expressive. And someone said DSLs. And then it just went to hell, right? Um, you know, Rake was born, which was a Ruby make, which was a little bit more expressive. And then the JVM got Gradle, .NET got Peacetake, Cake, and Fake, which apparently Fake is the best one. And do you know what JavaScript got? It got Jake. <laughs> but they didn't, there is Jake, there is. But they didn't have enough with Jake, so they came up with Grunt, which really requires 670 dependencies to output one file into another folder. But someone said Grunt is really ugly, so I'll come up with Gulp, which is fantastically pipey. And if building software is hard, what is even harder is building scalable software. And we've come up with what I call Silicon Valley Syndrome, which is if you are building software, you need it to scale. It doesn't matter if it's for a single individual or whatever, you need it to scale. And you know who tells you these? All of those wonderful cloud providers that give you what? Scalability, right? But you're like, no, it's just for you know, the corner shop. It doesn't matter. Scale. You just turn a knob, move that dial. It scales, right? And everything we do, it needs to scale. Now, if you're not into the software stuff, new doors have opened for us, right? And it is, not microservices, but the Internet of Things. Now, that is a Raspberry Pi connected to my toilet, OK? It was a mock-up that I did. And, I, and, and the idea behind that was that I can sit face forward on my toilet, sorry, too much information, and tweet the flusher, you know, Hardy's flusher, at Hardy's flusher, and then that would flush my toilet. So I wouldn't have to turn around, right? You know, changing the world. And um, I, I tweeted that as a mock-up. And someone, the first response was, um, how do you make sure that the cable doesn't get wet? Right? <laughs> Sorry, I've got to take a moment here. <laughs> There's no glasses. OK. Um, and it, it, if that's not your thing, DevOps should be your thing, because apparently empathy is something that you can tool, hire, and certify on. OK? And if you're not into DevOps, don't worry. It's already dead, because managed services are killing them. And finally, of course, all of these silver bullets and all of these issues that we already had we lived through them in parallel with something else, which was called methodology. OK? Oh, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Whiskey in it. 
So the methodology, I'm sure you all remember waterfall. Yes? Because it sucked. Scrum is the new waterfall, right? And Scrum, now we're evaluating what exactly we're doing with Scrum and whether we are doing stand-ups now in Slack and sit-ups to keep meetings short. There was an article that said you actually do sit-ups while you're in your Scrum meeting to keep it short, right? And it's fantastic. Now, last I checked, Lean doesn't suck, but that was only about two hours ago, so you might go and want to check that out before you adopt Lean. But if you really think about it, we are geniuses. Seriously, we are absolute geniuses because by and large, what we've actually done is create a self-sustaining industry, right? I've created what, what's called the IT life cycle. New technology comes out, we recommend it, then we sell it, we provide training for it, normally in the, in the, in the way of two-day certificates. Um, you know, you become a certified whatever. And then we implement it, we put it into production. And then the customer calls us saying something's gone wrong. And guess what we have? A new technology, right? And the circle just goes round and round. Now, it would be kind of hypocritical for me to stand up here and you know, say that this is consultants and developers and trainers and all that. We all have tool in this game because guess what? We tool it for you at JetBrains, right? So we offer you all of that. And on now, on top of that, we offer it on subscription basis, OK? And if you look at the technology lifecycle, what happens is that re nowadays, you create a new framework, then you create a conference around this framework, and then you go to 10, right? That's basically what happens. And it could be a framework, it could be a technology. Remember serverless architectures? This conference was in May, and it sold out. Over 1,000 people. Some of us don't even know what serverless means, but it's awesome. But unfortunately, the honeymoon is going to be over soon because it's called machine learning. And at that point, we're all going to die. We're going to be out of jobs. That's it. I mean, we're done. Um, Facebook is releasing a whole bunch of bots. And apparently, it says that it wants to use the bots uh, to kind of like interact with you like you interact with your friends. I only discovered, like, I, I quit Facebook because I didn't have any friends. Um, so, um, you know, maybe the four that I had were bots. And anyway, at this point, I will shut up and stop, right? And you're probably going to ask, OK, blah, blah, blah. You've made fun of everything and anything that's under the sun. You've had a nice laugh. What is your point? I don't have any point, right? <laughs> I don't. Like, but, I, but, I, but you can't reproach me about this. You can't give me a red card, because when you came in, I said, you're not going to learn anything. It's not informative. It's not bloody entertaining. And it sure as hell is an inspiration. I've just said that we're all Bloody bastards, in a sense, right? <laughs> Including me. What is my point? There is no point. There is actually one point. If you didn't know, there is no silver bullet, right? Other than that, I don't really have a point. But let me just step back a second and say, like, OK, so why the hell are we constantly jumping onto new technologies all the time? Why? Why are we doing this, right? And to answer that question, we've got to step back. Right? So let's step back and say, why did we get into software development? And this is where I turn it over to you and ask you, my dear friends, why did you get into software development? Who got into this for the money? Well, you're doing SharePoint, but apart from that. <laughs> Who else? Who got into it because they like to um, automate stuff? Challenging, solving problems. Potentially even helping people once you realize that it was fun and, oh, and I can actually help people get stuff done better. I can automate stuff so that people have more free time with their children and to go out and take long walks. And we, at some point, we didn't know when to stop because we're actually automating people out of a job. And at some point, we'll automate ourselves out of a job. But that's another conversation to have over whiskey. Um, but none of us got into this for software, right? Or let alone, none of us got into this because they said, you know what I love doing? Writing some code and spending the rest of my life upgrading to new frameworks. That's what I like to do, right? Now, we've got a really, really, really high technology churn. I mean, while I have been here on stage, there's probably a new framework that's come out, right? And a new paradigm. Um, the reality is that we can't always be on the latest and greatest. It's kind of like, you know, I'm not going to buy a laptop because I'm going to wait until the prices go down and get a better spec. It's, it, you'll always end up with, you know, not ever buying anything. But you say, no, what we're doing, we're actually innovating, right? What are we doing with all of these new technologies and things? We're innovating, we're finding new ways to improve. And I tell you that that is great. Innovation and improvement is good. And I'm very serious about that because I've put this in Comic Sans in red. But I've done it on purpose. So if there's one slide you remember, it's that one. But 
what exactly are we actually improving, right? So when we're adopting these new frameworks, technologies, et cetera, what exactly are we improving? And what is the business value that it is adding by adopting these things, right? And when I say business value, I don't mean BDD, OK? Or forget business value. How exactly does it bring value to us, right? And how are we making these technological choices? Do we use reasoning like, you know, well, Walmart has moved to Node.js. Therefore, Walmart's big. Walmart's successful. I'm going to move to Node.js. Why not? Or are we influenced by thought leaders or technology radars or industry or speakers coming up on stage and saying, WCF is great. I'm sorry about that. I really am. I made two mistakes in my life. One of them was that, and the other one was recommending AngularJS. <laughs> so, you know, when we listen to these people, do we take into account whether we have the same needs as them? Do we have the same needs as Walmart or Google or Netflix, right? Do the same conditions apply when we listen to these scalability factors and these microservices and these orchestration and all of these different technologies? Because you see, one, time, one thing that we usually forget is context. And context is a really, really important word. You know? We don't always have those same needs. A technological choice applies in a certain specific context when it matches certain conditions. And maybe their needs aren't the same as our needs. It's exactly like best practices. You know? Best practices aren't always best practices. They depend on when and where. So then how do we make these technological choices? There's actually like, is it technological driven, right? Technology driven design. You know, there's a website that you can go and put random crap together and say, I built this. And you're like, why? Like, why did you connect Kafka to whatever? Well, because it's cool. But why do you need it? Because I needed a logger. For what? Well, OK, never mind. Um, you know, do we take into account technology st stability? Is it proven technology? What is the learning curve for this technology? What is the market share for this technology? Do we take any of those things into account? And do we really evaluate costs? How many times when we've had to create a new addition or extension or whatever to our application or even implement a new one, do we ever think down and say, sit down and say, you know what? Let me break down the costs of rewriting this versus extending. Right? Do we ever do that? No, new shiny, right? And then do we validate our investment? Yeah, with the new Node.js conversion, we're saving three hours a day. Really? Did you actually measure that? And by the way, did you lose six months when they pulled left pad? Because if things go bad, we're not Google or Facebook, right? We're burning money. I mean, they burn money as well, but they got a little bit more money than we got, right? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming some of you might have more. But. And what's important, does it impact our pay? How many of you, your boss or manager or whoever, if you're working for an employer, comes to you and says, you know how you chose AngularJS? Bad choice. I'm going to cut your salary this month. Not really, right? It doesn't impact our pay, does it? No. So what do we have to lose? Shit, we're learning in the process. What do we have to lose? Ah, go sour? Well, we'll do it again, right? And that's caused by a financial impotence mismatch, right? And that's why I say that every developer at some point in their life should set up their own business and really start to evaluate decisions based on exactly why they're making them, not just because it's beautiful. Because if it doesn't bring value to the business, why the hell are we doing it, right? And are we actually confusing our desire to learn with business value? Oh, I want to learn something new. I could use this technology in this new project. And why not? You know, We're just chasing that new shiny. Are our decisions actually CV-based? Are we doing CV-driven design? Right? And of course, a lot of this is not our own fault because there's social pressure. You know, there's, I mean, I've heard, I came from Delphi, and people are saying, Delphi, you're still doing Delphi, you poor, poor bastard. Why are you doing Delphi? Well, the Rosetta Comet is actually, has software written in Delphi. And you know what? Delphi is still being used, and people are writing applications that impact people's lives in a good way, right, by saving lives. I'm not talking about, you know, um, 
things that track how many steps your dog makes when it does exercises with you, actually changing people's lives. And then we make fun of things like this, like JSON X is an IBM standard format to represent JSON as XML. I mean, you've got to laugh. You see that and you're like, what the hell? Like, why? Why would someone want to represent JSON as XML? You know why? It's actually for a security proxy because it's cheaper to do it that way. It is cheaper to interrupt with that with a hack than it is to have to rewrite everything, right? But we don't look at these things. But you say, no, but this, it, you see, it's not so much about that. It's that we need to attract new talent, right? No one's going to come and say, oh, you want a job in Delphi? Actually, now if you're a good consultant in Delphi, you're going to make a lot of money, right? Because you know the pond shrinks and the fish become bigger. There's good money in COBOL as well, I hear. This is what we put on our CVs, isn't it? I know AngularJS, I know Aurelia, well, it's not Aurelia. I was Durand on that, it's called Aurelia, React, jQuery, JavaScript, Java, Clojure, C Sharp, VB, SQL Server, MongoDB. This is what we put, this is what we look for. We don't say, oh, you know, I have a brain, and I know software engineering principles, which can't be said, unfortunately, for quite a, anyway, experience. I've saved, you know, millions of lines of code, writing software to cut our bureaucratic cross. We don't explain what we've done. We focus on what technologies we know, right? And how many of you actually here want to be valued based on your tech stack? Probably no one, because you know that when a new technology comes along, you'll easily learn it, right? Because technologies come and go, right? We've all learned multiple technologies, and we can continue to learn multiple technologies. We're in one of those jobs which we exercise our brain continuously, and we're fortunate enough to be able to do that. So why are we so obsessed with, oh, I need to put C-sharp on my CV? We are feeding the same cycle that is backfiring on us, right? We need to be on the cutting edge. I'm not denying that. We need to learn. We need to come to conferences. We need to look up new technologies. We need to evaluate these technologies. But we also need to question when and why to adopt these technologies. And we shouldn't adopt it based on hype, you know, or hype-driven development. There are people that actually choose packages, technologies based on GitHub forks and stars. There are, right? You go to an NPM, what's the first thing you do? You go to the GitHub package and say, how many forks does it have? Why? In case the original developer drops support, you're going to go to the forked version? How many times do you do that? Hardly ever. You bitch and moan and say, oh, this, this is no longer maintained. Or are you doing adoption based on technology radars? Or, as I said earlier, thought leaders. You know, everyone, everyone has a reason to say everything, even me. Right? So always take things with a pinch of salt. And then, of course, there's the adoption based on assumed correlation. You know, Netflix adopted microservices. Netflix is successful. Therefore, we should adopt mi microservices. Are you doing high video streaming to millions of people worldwide and doing all of these other things like catalog display, et cetera, microservices? No. Why? It's, it's quite cool. That I heard that so is a ball of mud. Microservices is really cool. Yes, have they told you about all of the maintainability nightmare that goes into microservices? No, but I can log stuff and look at it in a beautiful panel and see things go back and forth. It's brilliant, right? You know that in 2013, Uber migrated um, from MySQL to PostgreSQL, right? In July 2016, um, Uber switched from Postgres to MySQL. Yes. Just something to take into account when you adopt technology based on others. And the reality is that we really have a lot of potential. You know, we are in an in a ever-evolving field where we are given the opportunity to constantly be learning and improving ourselves, right? So why waste it on hype? And why take our talent and waste it on effortless things that no one's going to appreciate and it's not going to actually change or impact anyone's lives? And yet, we have the potential to do that. We really do. I mean, how many other jobs in the world actually can impact people's lives for the better? Very few. And we're in that field that is constantly challenging us, right? So let's just focus on the right things, OK?
So now go learn and apply everything without judgment. Thank you.